Joe and I, as the moderators for today, would like to make this session as interactive as possible. So to raise your questions, either to a specific speaker or the general panel, please feel free to at any time always use the chat. I see that people have already been using it a bit, and that's very good. Keep up the good work. Um, Jill and I will manage and select the questions to pose, um, and we will give you the opportunity to verbally elaborate on the question during the Q&A. So overall, we really hope to have a fruitful and above else a respectful discussion. So um, to also introduce myself, I am Naomi Appelman, and together with Jill Toe, we will be moderating today's session. We are together with Hans Svart, who isn't here today, uh, the co-founders of the Racism and Technology Center that is responsible for the organization of today's session. So as to the structure, I will firstly be giving a brief introduction of the topic of this panel and the Racism and Technology Center as the organizer of it. Then we will have a presentation by our three amazing speakers on the Dutch Child Benefit Scandal as a case study for how to make the debate on digital rights less technocentric. After these presentations, Jill will pose some further questions to the speakers with the aim to draw out the broader lessons from this specific case study for the digital rights field, and after which we hope to open it up for questions, and um, hopefully there will be a lot of that and we ha can have a fruitful discussion. So I think that most people are here by now, and I think I'll just add into the substance. So as we wrote in the panel description, with this session, we want to contribute to making the debate on digital rights, and then specifically in relation to marginalized voices, less technocentric. So as is also indicated by the broader theme of uh, this year's privacy camp, it's necessary to reevaluate how the digital right field sees technology as a driving role in exacerbating and perpetuating social injustices. Within this broader idea, we have selected as a guiding question how we can identify the real harms automated systems can generate without disregarding the historical and social context that produced these systems in the first place and that these systems operate in. So in this panel, we concretely want to use the Dutch child benefit scandal as a specific and local case study, which can function as a starting point to have this broader discussion. So this specific and local case study opens up to a broader discussion on racist practices by governments, um, the increasing use of new technologies such as automated decision-making systems in government agencies, and importantly, the potentially outsized role that algorithms play in these discussions about these systems. So we as the Racism and Technology Center found it important to organize this panel as it connects very closely to the center's core mission. Jilto, Hans Svart and myself founded the Racism and Technology Center to help bridge the gap between anti-racist organizations and organizations that focus on digital rights. So we saw that where the former can often feel they lack the expertise or even the agency to address racism in a technological context. The latter, the digital rights organizations, are more often than not have a blind spot for these type of questions on inequality or, or racial inequality, as is also very much the theme of uh, this year's privacy camp. So what we overall hope to achieve with this panel is to identify concrete harms as well as to provide nuance to the discussion by decentering, by decentering the role of technologies vis-a-vis -vis social injustices. So originally the ambition for this panel was to also center local knowledge and expertise by inviting anti-racist organizations from the Netherlands. However, due to capacity issues, both on our side, from the Racism and Technology Center, and um, for the anti-racism organizations we approached, and of course the short time span that Privacy Camp has, we unfortunately weren't able to do so. We feel this is also indicative of the broader issues and problems you run into um, trying to prioritize affected people in the discussions in primarily expert-dominated spaces, such as this one is as well. 
So this this shows how within the digital rights field, and of course much broader, there's also a need to rethink more fundamentally who participates in discussions and how we can create space for the right people. I'm sure that our discussions today and no doubt the inspiring talks by our speakers will give us a lot to work with and how to make the debate on digital rights less technocentric and more focused on the people affected. So having said this, I want to turn now to our three wonderful speakers of today, Nadia, Miro and Sana. And as they are uh, most capable of introducing themselves, I would like to ask them to do so before we move on to the presentation. Nadia, can I start with you and ask you to introduce yourself? Yes, of course. Thanks so much for having me. I am Nadia Benaisa. I'm a lawyer. I work at Busy Freedom, which is a digital rights organization based in the Netherlands. I mainly focus on AI and GDPR uh, issues. Thank you so much and amazing to have you here today. Um, Sanne, can I ask you? Hi, I'm Sana. Uh, I work for the Justice, Equity and Technology Table, a network uh, that tries to address the impact of data-driven policing all over Europe. Um, and I'm super happy to join you today from a quite grey Amsterdam. I'd say a very grey Amsterdam. Very happy to have you here. And last but certainly not least, Merel. Hi everybody, I'm Merel Koning. I'm a senior policy advisor at Amnesty International and I lead the Dutch technology program there. All right, thank you so much. So now we can move on to the brief five to seven minute presentations by our three speakers, um, inspired by specific questions we discussed beforehand, um, allowing us to really zoom into the different aspects of, of this case study and to draw out these broader questions later. So to start with Miro, what we discussed that um, your, your talk would be inspired by is the question how the Dutch child benefit scandal has been framed and discussed. So can I please give you the floor? Yes, yes, and thank you. Um, so um, how the Dutch child care benefit scandal was framed and discussed, I think the question should be slightly different. How is it still framed and discussed? Because it's an ongoing problem that um, the Dutch uh, the childcare benefit scandal is seen as an administrative failure. So um, for those who are not familiar with the case, I will give a brief introduction to it. Um, from 2013 onwards, the Dutch tax authorities increasingly used algorithmic systems to detect uh, fraud or potential fraud with people who applied for childcare benefits. Uh, child care benefits is a system in the Netherlands where you can apply and you can bring your child to check um, your child to daycare. It's great. And then um, you get part of the, uh, the cost um, reimbursed from the government. In this whole system, um, there was a strong um, idea with the tax authorities there, that there was a lot of fraud. So they used automated systems to detect this type of fraud. In the initial algorithm, one of the parameters that was used was whether or not you had a uh, Dutch nationality. And that criteria mattered whether or not your risk score was increased. And that's racist. That is discriminatory. And that has been under the radar for many years in the Netherlands. What has also been under the radar is that this automated system that was used, used the self-learning algorithm. And over the course of time, this algorithm taught itself to focus primarily on people from low income uh, groups. So people who were in higher income groups, they were less seen as potential fraudsters and people with low income were seen as potential fraudsters. So they also, in got a higher risk score in the end. So what happened was that people from low income um, families with migration backgrounds were the first people that were selected as potential fraudsters. And what happened once you were selected as a potential fraudster is very devastating and uh, uh, well, a black page in the history of uh, Dutch government. 
because fold after fold after fold was made. Not only the algorithm was pro problematic, but also the handling of the Dutch tax authorities afterwards. And quite um, um, problematic, not only the Dutch tax authorities, but also the courts that were supposed to protect these people. Um, people were labeled as fraudsters uh, where they were not. They had to repay all the childcare benefits at once um, people lost their houses, they lost their jobs. In the end, 70,000 uh, children became the victim of this scandal and more than 10, well, tens of thousands of families are impacted. And until this day, there is still no substantive um, solution for this. How it was framed in the media was as an administrative failure. How of course, as Amnesty International, we think this should be framed, is a human rights problem. And not only a human rights problem stemming from the use of automated decision-making systems, but a human rights problem stemming from institutional racism and sus sustained uh, inequality and uh, prolonged inequality and translated inequality into automated systems. The system was both discriminatory on the base of race and ethnicity and on social and economic class. And with regard to the last uh, type of discrimination, this is still, um, nobody's talking about this in the Netherlands. The whole childcare benefit scandal is not framed as a social economic problem or a social economic discrimination and the problem of discrimination as such but it is still seen as administrative failure. We also see that in the way that the Dutch government is picking uh, this up and trying to repair this, many mm, guidance papers and uh, quite frankly, um, open and voluntary standards are now being uh, discussed and developed within the government, whereas strict mandatory legislation for um, people working in the government um, to make sure that human rights are protected and to make sure that their practices are becoming less racist over time, or of course, at least immediately would be best. Um, this is still lacking and this is very problematic in the framing. I think I'll just stop here and then um, uh, continue via questions later on. Thank you so much for giving this uh, um, overview of what the scandal actually is in this um, great commentary to start with. And also thank you very much for staying perfectly within the time. Then we will be moving on to our second speaker, Sonem. And the guiding question that your uh, presentation was inspired on is what are the shortcomings and missing perspectives in these discussions? Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Mero, also for this great introduction. Um, I just want to start by saying that my background is not only um, in this topic, but when I was 11, my father, the breadwinner of the family, was fired. Um, he appealed this and it was judged unruly. And he got some damage payments, but he was also considered too old on the job market and his mental health spiraled down. And we were on benefits for many, many years. And I know firsthand from this experience what it means, uh, though I must add that we did have some privileges um, that even though my father had mental health problems, he was kind of sort of higher educated. So he spent much time appealing to the decisions of the uh, tax um, uh, system and writing letters and so on. And he had that capacity kind of. And um, also, we had some kind of safety net of some family that could come to aid uh, when there was a real emergency. So our situation was in many respects still one of certain privileges, um, but you can imagine that this experience prompted much interest for me in, you know, how how this whole benefit system works. Um, it also made me, I think, a way more sensitive for what it feels like to be on benefits, what, what the impact is beyond the material impact, the psychological impact, etc. 
Um, so I closely followed the scandal. And for me, what I actually like to stress today is that I, I, the way I've read it and analyzed it and followed it is actually the minor role of technology in this case. And this is where I think there's a difference between maybe me and how Amnesty sees it. I mean, I definitely agree it was framed as an administrative issue and not a human rights issue. Um, and I would add that it should not only be framed much more as a human rights issue, but as a social justice issue. Um, and I'm going to try to explain as quick as I can uh, what that means for me. Like reading the careful investigative research that was done by many uh, journalists, uh, looking at the internal documents that were released as part of the big FOIA request, that like tech was one of the least of the issues here, unlike some other scandal like RoboDebt in Australia or some, or some of the great examples that are given in um, the book Automating Inequality. And what is striking when looking into this, not surprising, and I will get back to why it was not surprising in the least, uh, but it was striking at the level of like the complete obsession with potential fraud and the stubborn persistence to hunt down people for fraud, ignoring all the evidence the beneficiaries brought to the fore, which proved there was no fraud. The department that was tasked with fraud detection was choosing to follow the horrendous policy um, in its most strict sense. They were choosing to follow the policies furthermore in a horrendous, very human-driven insistence on the most denigrating, humiliating, racist stereotypes. If you read their emails, it's, it's like, it's very sickening. Um, the way they insisted to search their kind of shadow database for nationality on, or an, uh, ethnicity was not just something automated or something that an algorithm uh, kind of prompted. It was very human driven. Um, and the complete disregard and I would say sociopathic lack of empathy um, was also very human driven. And now, and that's another thing that I found lacking in this debate, is that this is, of course, nothing new. There's a long historical lineage from the poor houses and the poor colonies in the Netherlands, for example, Feinhuizen, and the poor colonies that were invited, mind you, by a certain gentleman who also served the Dutch overseas colonies, where he repressed the local population there. There's a direct link. And if one wants to understand how this could have happened, it's this fundamental hunting down and disciplining of the poor since centuries, uh, the malicious distinction made between the undeserved and the poor. Now, all of this is not to say that technology has always been instrumental in these repressive efforts. Um, one can see that also in history, and we can talk about that more if it interests you, and that there's this kind of specific role of technology that, that makes it a very powerful weapon. Um, it's not only that technology is instrumental for power in its efficiency, which the promise does not always fulfill, but it's functioning as this rationalizing, normalizing, and neutralizing shield for what's obviously not a technocratic matter of catching corrupt behavior, but a form of class war, I would say. And Ruha Benjamin also describes this uh, magic power of, of technology to make it something neutral, something outside politics. And what I'm struggling with, um, is that as soon as we localize the problem within the technology somehow, as soon as we point to the algorithm and declare uh, how racist it indeed is and connect that to how it should be more ethical or objective, how privacy should be built in, human rights standards should be built in, in some way, though this work is important, but we have to be wary that there's a danger of disconnecting the technology as the politicians do, from the power structures, from ideology, as if there can be something as fair tech in an unfair world, as if there can be something like a fair uh, welfare fraud uh, detection algorithm, right? Now, because what you get is some kind of mirror image of tech solutionism as, as this old discourse of tech solutionism where tech would save us because, you know, 
it solves the flawed human that is the problem and then the neutral technology is a solution. Now it becomes you know, the technology, the calculating computers, the cold algorithms that we point to as the cause of evil. As if what and how they calculate is not completely human designed, as if not all tech is human. And what I hear a lot in the Tuschlag affair, and this is why I kind of extensively make that point, around me I hear a lot of people say, uh, they're like, oh, it's such a scandal, and these algorithms, the computers, the inhumanity of those automated systems, and there's this like common consensus that uh, what is called in Dutch, the menselijke maat was lost, which means like the humor measure or scale, the human in the loop. But it was full of humans in the loop. Um, and it makes me shiver as I think of all the humans making the policies and the plans, the humans assessing the cases, the humans um, of the control teams, and the racist slurs, their house visits. And I think of the very humans on our doorsteps in my youth, their tone of voice, the contempt, the contempt born from the way the poor are seen as suspect and criminal. Um, there's a whole range of papers and research on the repressive wel welfare state for people to dig in. Um, and, but I want to, like, I also want to, to propose kind of an alternative um, and um, move, first of all, this debate from the expert dri driven spaces that tend to come with maybe experts like including me here, right? Um, like uh, the, deba the, the debate is often happening in expert spaces as this, like technology, uh, legal spaces. Um, and we did with the table of justice, equity and technology, we did this session with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. And they kind of emphasized that their work um, um, really looks to kind of go further um, because they feel that these expert conversations kind of narrowly define how the harms of these systems are to be understood. And it creates an emphasis on issues of bias and transparency or debates around constitutional violations. And these kind of priorities and politics are not necessarily relevant for people experience the harm most directly. For them, it doesn't really matter if there's that if they're surveyed legally or illegally, like the, the consequence is st still there. So they really say we've had enough. Um, and I see that I'm a bit over time. So I'm going to round up here. Um, and they propose a different model, which is here, which is looking at these systems with the system. Um, because they said, you know, you need to look beyond the programs to the broader inputs and ecosystems surrounding them. If you're fighting against a particular problem, program or system or algorithm, the response will be, you're right, that's bad. Let's take a new thing, which is in fact designed to be, to be more durable and can outmaneuver the criticism that the community was making. So to really address the root causes the way poverty is, is, is seen, the kind of ideology behind this hunt uh, on these parents and dismantle the system. You cannot just be organizing against one example. You need to target not only the particular program, but the entire ecosystem that surrounds this. Um, and the question of how to do that, we can discuss later. Thank you so much, Sana, for this very powerful um, and, and also inspiring presentation. And last but certainly not least, uh, on to Nadia, who will take the first steps into drawing the discussion a bit broader. And the guiding question that we discussed is how does this relate to broader issues on the use of technology in government and its related agencies? Nadia? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mira and Sana, for sharing your thoughts. I agree with a lot that has been said, so I'm sure there will be some overlap in, uh, in my thoughts that I'm about to share. But I would still like to stress out two issues that the child benefit scandal illustrates really well, which is uh, discrimination, uh, firstly, and the second one is lack of transparency, accountability, and effective redress. 
Uh, so like uh, Merel has mentioned before, while hunting on fraud cases in which parents might have received unlawful child benefit allowance, the tax authority thought that people with a second nationality, meaning ethnic minorities, and people with a lower income, meaning people who need the benefits most, might have a, a higher risk of committing fraud. So many were categorized as fraudsters, and the allowances, in many cases, thousands of euros uh, uh, were recovered. And people lost their jobs because they couldn't afford daycare anymore. People lost their houses because uh, the debts were unpayable. Uh, and this has led to broken homes in which children were grown up in poverty. Uh, and some were even removed from their parents. So this was a result of racism and social economic discrimination. Some blamed this on a broken system. We disagree. The system isn't broken. The system and its algorithms are doing exactly what they're told by people. And we need to face that we as a people face serious problems in our societies that need to be addressed. Uh, we face discrimination, we face a lack of freedom of speech and freedom of religion, violations to the right of privacy, and so on and so forth. So the standards that many countries have agreed upon uh, uh, years ago when it comes to fundamental rights are still not effective in reality. Therefore, it isn't strange that the data that comes out from our society are a reflection of the problems that we're facing. This data isn't neutral or objective because society isn't, and neither is government policy. We've already seen too many cases in which our government has willingly profiled on ethnic minorities and people with a low income. Not accidentally, not because of a broken system, but willingly because some governments and policymakers thinks it's a, think it's a good idea to make discriminating policy. We often speak of algorithm, algorithmic biases, and we should, but let's also not forget that these biases are mirroring our societies. And therefore, we need to make sure that AI legislation protects fundamental rights, which brings me to my second issue, lack of transparency, accountability, and effective redress. So many people who were affected by the tax authority were people of color, and many had a feeling they were ethnically profiled but they were unable, unable to prove it. And at some point, a group of people used their right of access to find out what has led to decision-making in their dossier. And in response to that, the tax authority sent them large directories that were almost completely blackened and therefore unable to read. And even though this part wasn't even about the algorithms, this illustrates perfectly how important transparency in decision-making really is. So in Dutch administrative law, government bodies are obliged to motivate their decisions in an understandable way, uh, and decisions should be free from discrimination and arbitrariness. And people need to be able to object to a decision and have access to a judge to fight a decision. So these are basic rights that should be normal in a democratic society. However, the current law proposal, the Artificial Intelligence Act, does not provide this level of legal protection yet. People have hardly any rights to, uh, to enforce transparency, much less accountability. And for some reason, we're setting the bar really low when it comes to legal protection against AI. And of course, we know that transparency and accountability are words that are easily, easier said than done, as technology doesn't seem to be ready to make decisions that are uh, uh, understandable for humans. However, by setting the bar this low, no developer will be challenged to improve that. So to sum up, the EU seems to be in a race trying to compete with major powers um, that are running ahead in AI development, which is really a stupid thing to do. The EU should be setting an example on how to innovate while protecting human rights. We think that's the only way that is future proof.
Thank you so much, Nadia, for uh, also connecting this discussion to the EU regulatory debate and what's going on there. I think it's also a very productive perspective. Now, before we move on to the broader discussion and uh, Jill's questions, I do want to give you three the opportunity to respond to each other if there are already concrete things you want to say or ask. Um, and if not, we can move on to the questions and keep the, the different discussion for the Q&A. But please grab the floor if there are any reactions. If not, then I am yeah. very good. <laughs> Maybe yeah. um, just to stress that um, the, um, the root causes that were um, outlined by Sonne, um, this is absolutely something that is seen um, by a human rights organization such as Amnesty International looking at the um, the child care benefits scandal on the tech side um, for for us is a way to have an example and show how these systemic injustices translate to um, once they are being automated um, so I, I I do feel that maybe we're not that far apart um, in um, in, in seeing the issue, uh, absolutely in how we then uh, address it as um, MSD works with international human rights standards is very differently. And I see uh, amazing opportunities to, um, to merge these two and uh, also the work of chat. So I have a question actually, can I pose a question to a different panel member? Yeah, um, because um, I am very um, curious what type of um, solutions or what type of um, uh, pro processes or um, work you are doing. And um, also, um, you mentioned bias, transparency. These are very expert solutions that do not directly address the uh, situation or the problems that um, affected communities feel or that they feel that should be dealt with. Can you elaborate on that a bit more? Because I think that would be really valuable for a digital rights um, crowd, such as we have here at Privacy Cam. Thank you, Mel. And of course, I, I, uh, I agree that uh, we, we have similar, I think uh, we are allies in this fight, right? Um, so, uh, what what do we do to address these issues? I think um, our focus as a table is much more to to look at like how can you strengthen the communities um, to um, kind of yeah to contend with the systems like build grassroots power organizing um, do their own community driven research choose their own priorities on what they can want to campaign about etc and also support each other learn from each other in these fights so that's the work the network is trying to do um, and we're also trying to find points of interventions at different levels. So, like for example, I think this community grassroots driven world uh, uh, work is something that a lot of people saying like that's a good idea. We should do more of that. Sadly, there's hardly any funding for it. I must say that capacity mostly goes to um, these expert places of like legal contestation or um, um, technology design, etc. Um, so there's an issue there, um, but um, this this grassroots organizing. I think how do you do that without I think kind of exploiting these communities again, you know, or uh, being um, fetishizing community activism? I think that's a very interesting question, and there I would like to pose or to propose that we as experts in a certain um, I don't know if I want to call myself expert, but here I am, right? <laughs> um, that we in our uh, all address this issue also in our environment. So for example, 
um, I want to give this example for this crowd specifically. One of our members, No Tech for Tyrants, addresses the role of academia in designing uh, kind of harmful technologies, addresses the funding from like Deloitte, from all these like welfare fraud detection algorithm, algorithm designers, um, address kind of these programs that, um, for example, EU funded in the A AI arms race promise all the solutions of, uh, of AI to solve our discrimination, to solve our biases, etc. But of course, don't deliver that in a very unjust uh, system, system, as Nadia um, already spoke out. Um, and this, this, I think what uh, hearing from people and also from my experience, I think what, what is super important, this, what is a super important distinction to make is this focus on universal human rights standards versus a community that's criminalized and for whom these uni so-called universal human rights standards often do not apply by, because they're by governments, they're pushed into anti-terrorism um, uh, like programs, into fraudsters, into etc. So of course, like the fight for for strong for for the actual implementation of human rights. I mean, if we could already do that, it's amazing. And I support all the court cases that are being fought there, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's a big part that even if you say like we're against like we want to um, make sure that there is a better legal framework that you will see that these communities are criminalized and therefore the protection that that offers to many of us won't offer them protection. And this is also my experience in, in my personal life. And this is also why I'm a very cynical person about like legal kind of um, um, pathways. So. I apologize for that because I do see that it's one of the parts of the struggle that it's important, just as the grassroots act activism is. And just as like, let's just be honest, the material supports like working for that for people, you know, supporting them, helping people to fill out their documents or forms, for example. That's also a really important part of the struggle of the grassroots groups that uh, we're working with. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Sonia. Perfect. Um, I think it's such an important point also to emphasize the, the limitations of these human rights standards in this regard and the exceptions and the suspension of normal protection if you talk about these type of cases. But if um, there are no other specific interventions and points more focused on the child benefit scandal, I would like to give the floor to Jill. Yeah, hi. Thank you, Naomi, um, also for your wonderfully composed and calm moderating skills, and also for the speakers for sharing um, their perspective. I think I also want to pick up, uh, I mean, we've already kind of gone into a, a little bit like reflecting on the broader kind of uh, discussions beyond the Dutch childcare benefit scandal. Uh, but then I think bringing back to Sana's last point and also Nadia's uh, previous uh, presentation um, in the sense of Nadia, how do you kind of see um, or how would you react, I think, to some of the issues that, that Sana has raised, right? Like this kind of um, not tension, but kind of how uh, there's this a lot of energy being put into um, uh, reacting or contributing to, to some of the legal frameworks that are ongoing uh, at the EU level and increasingly so because uh, there are even more proposals which also requires the effort of yeah, civil society and NGOs uh, uh, reacting to those. But then also where does that leave uh, the resources uh, that are needed um, or organizations, organizations and, and expert expertise that are needed for these kind of communities? How do you see, I would say, not re reconciling, but how do we move forward uh, in terms of the, the idea that, um, well, there are just a lack of resources in so many areas? Um, could you respond a little bit to, to that? Of course, and um, yeah, I can I can definitely understand uh, where Sana is coming from. Uh, uh, with, as she says, a cynical view on uh, on law. 
um, I, as a lawyer, was <laughs> obviously triggered by that as I uh, became a lawyer to, to fight this uh, social injustice. Uh, I really view the law as a tool to challenge these injustices. Uh, but I definitely agree that uh, our human rights framework um, is great in theory, but uh, is not effective yet in uh, many countries that have um, agreed upon this framework. Uh, so there is a lot of work that still needs to be done um, uh, in that way. And I think um, uh, digital rights organizations, but also uh, uh, um, uh, anti-racism organizations and other organizations that are um, trying to improve um, the protection of human rights can contribute to that. Um, but we're facing a situation in which uh, governments, uh, especially in Europe uh, and the US, are um, are very racist uh, and are willingly um, making policies that are racist. Uh, so there is a huge gap between rights of the need to protect uh, um, uh, minorities uh, and affected groups uh, on one side um, and what these governments are doing on the other side. Yeah, thank, thank you, Nadia. Um, sorry, that's a question from Claire that I, I think uh, I will pick up uh, before. I, I have a lot of questions, actually, but I'm going to prioritize the Q&A. Um, so Claire is asking uh, whether anyone from the panel can tell us more about the legislative developments in the Netherlands um, as a scandal didn't affect the election results at all. And the government is still planning to continue with the fraud detection system, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so far what we have seen um, and what I've heard from the um, Secretary of State and the Minister that more than 320 initiatives have been started to uh, fix uh, the damage from the child care benefits care, uh, scandal, but there's no comprehensive list on what these initiatives are, so, um, or specific um, uh, criteria. Um, so this is very worrisome because the same group of government workers that um, continued and built this, uh, this place of, of in inequality in their systems now are internally fixing this, of course, with the help from outsiders. But if you, have, if you had an anti-discrimination course for maybe three afternoons, that is not enough to fix these inequalities. Like that is absolutely not enough. So this is highly problematic. Also, what we see in the because there's now finally a new government. The government fell over the child care benefit scandal in the beginning of 2021. Now, the beginning of or the end of 2022, there was finally a new government formed, and there's now a government. Um, hmm, how do you say that? statement like um, a plan for the next years and the uh, the human rights protection in order to uh, one address um, systemic racism and two also address the technology side uh, of this um, of the inequality that we saw um, with the um, uh, child care benefit scandal it is not enough it looks Great if you look at the government statement that there will be an AI supervisor, but guess what? That comes from EU regulation, the AI Act. So it's really like presenting it as a step forward, whereas that is the absolute minimum that you could copy and put in your uh, your plans, just what is happening in the EU.